Every time I click, it has the power of two. Every time I make an economic vote for the new system, it has the power of two because I'm taking one vote away from the existing system, minus one on their category, and I'm adding a vote to the new system. So it has the power of two, minus one for the old system, plus one for the new system. We do that 10 times a day. You make a thousand economic decisions a day. You don't need to change everything about your life. Just make 10 economic decisions per day for the new system. And guess what? After a year of Bitcoiners and, and freedom lovers doing that, we've made millions Millions and millions and millions of economic decisions, votes for the new system without changing a whole lot. And it's painless and it's easy. And guess what? We all understand that the power of compounding effects after a year or two years of doing that, we're going to have built something very, very magical, very beautiful. And we'll be like, wow, we did a lot in a short period of time. All right, Brian DeMint, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I'm, exci I'm excited to chat today. You got your Orange Bill app hat on. I think we'll definitely talk about that. But I wanted to begin with a pretty big question, actually. And that's uh, why is Bitcoin the most important thing anyone should study? Well, I, I personally don't think Bitcoin is the most important thing that anybody should study, but that's my personal opinion. I, I, I think that the questions of existence are probably more important. So for me, that's, that's a question of faith, but I, I think that, that we need to okay, ponder, I, I would agree to that, <laughs> ponder our, okay. our, our, our origins, I think. And mm -hmm. so, but shockingly, I think Bitcoin fits right into that. And I, th I think Bitcoin it, people, a, a lot of my friends say, wow, why do you spend so much time talking about Bitcoin and writing about Bitcoin and studying Bitcoin? Because I think it is very, very important to study. And so while I think it's maybe perhaps the second set, one of the, you know, one of the top most important things to study, I would say it is so important because it affects every other element of life. My, my friends that are very, very concerned with diet, with what they're putting in their bodies. Well, guess what? Money plays a role in the quality of our food. Are you worried about the education system? Well, guess what? Money plays a role in the quality of the education that our children get. Are you worried about housing prices? Money plays a role in the cost of your housing. So every element of society is affected by the underlying unit by which everything is, is, is measured. And money is how we measure goods and services and what things are valued in society. And so, yes, it is, it is critically important for people to study that. So, you know, if I, if I live on this earth for 70 or 80 years, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, that's why I think existential questions are more important because I believe that that goes into eternity. But what I do with the next 80 years of my life, I believe has eternal consequences. And so the, what I do with my money is critically important. I think that someday I'm going to be judged for how I used my money. If it was I a good steward, was I good at teaching others? Was I, was I loving and was I caring? And so I think that one of the, the most critical things we can do is understand money. I, I think that once you start to understand money, you understand how the fiat system works, you realize that it's a, it's a system to, designed to steal from people. And if I were to walk out in front of my house and see my neighbor getting held up at knife point by, by some random thief, if I just walk back in my house and do nothing, I believe that is immoral. I believe that that is a shortcoming of me as a man if I just walk back in my house. Now, I don't have to go and confront the villain. I don't have to go and, and fight that guy, but I can at least call the police or I can shout out and say, Hey, buddy, you're, there's a guy with a knife trying to get you right now. There's something I can do. Same thing with helping my friends and family and those that read my books or who, whoever listens to these podcasts that you're, that you're putting out. Like we can help people understand the problem that is, that is occurring in society, the theft that is happening. And so I believe that. If we study money and then we we do nothing with that, then I believe it. it's like watching our neighbor getting robbed and just going back into our house. So that's why I think it's so important, because if I'm going to speak out and talk about these things, it is important that I've studied money so that I, I'm not getting over my skis and saying something out of turn, um, because somebody will be very quick to dismiss you if you start to talk about something. And then all of a sudden it turns out that you really didn't consider the weight of your arguments very well. So yes, I do think it is incredibly important to study these things. And I think that they have lasting, long lasting consequences. Yeah. The, the full phrase of this question was actually the most important technological discovery, but I forgot that. But yeah, no, dude, I, I 100% agree with what you, what you said that, that should not come as a surprise, I think. But what I think is interesting is that you said, you know, shockingly, these, these topics are connected, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can go a bit deeper on that? Because I agree, but I'd love to hear where you see these things touch. 
Yeah, well, in in terms of the spiritual and the religious, I think that for for me as a Christian, I think that money plays a critical role. The Old Testament talks, and so this is for for people who are Jewish or anybody that believes in the Old Testament, so Christians as well. The the Old Testament talks frequently about fair monetary policy or unfair monetary scales or or unbalanced scales. The Lord detests those things. So it's a it's a religious conviction of Christians and Jews that immoral money is bad for society. It is sinful. It's a, it creates a sinful heart. And you look at the one time in the New Testament and in, in the Gospels when Jesus gets righteously angry, he literally, he, he, like, even when people are crucifying him, he, he turns the other cheek, right? He, he allows people to crucify. He allows th- terrible things to happen to him. But when he sees people at the temple, the temple money changers, taking advantage monetarily of pilgrims coming to the temple to worship God and then getting taken advantage of with their money. He literally fashions a whip and whips these guys out of the temple. So the one time you see Jesus get righteously angry, it was over money. It wasn't over people trying to kill him. It wasn't over people mocking him. It was of disadvantaged people being taken advantage of by those who knew what they were doing and using money to, to rip people off. That literally makes God angry. And then how does that connect to the other things? Well, I would say COVID in our lifetime was the most egregious offense of tyranny that most of us have ever witnessed. COVID, not the disease, but COVID, capital C COVID, like everything that came with it, lockdowns and everything. All of that has a direct connection to the money printer. COVID, I'm going to say this out loud. You can use this as, as, as a little clickbait clip. COVID would not have happened if it wasn't for the existence of central banks. And let me explain what I mean by that. Do you think people would have stayed in their houses? People would have stayed home from work. People would have just kept their kids out of school if they weren't bribed to do so. Think about that. People got stimulus checks. People got businesses got PPP loans and, and protection and, and, and businesses got hundreds of thousands of dollars sent to them just to stay closed down. None of that came out of tax revenues. That's, that's the business of a government is supposed to be tax revenues and then they have, they can, they can spend out of tax revenues. That's what people think. COVID expenses so far exceeded tax revenues that, that tax revenues had nothing to do with the payments made to people for COVID. People were bribed to stay at home because of COVID. And then beyond that, experimental drugs were developed again, using money, money printing dollars. So you had people were coerced to stay inside, bribed to stay inside because of it. Businesses were, were bribed to enforce these policies. Media was, was given advertising dollars by all the pharmaceutical companies who were getting billions of dollars to develop their new drugs. And then these experimental drugs were, were, were coerced to uh, on the people because of that. All of those things were only made possible because central banks around the world created new liquidity, liquidity of dollars. That, that enabled that to happen. If you don't have that, if you had a gold standard or if you had hard money of any kind in government, you would not have had COVID in the way that we had COVID. Yeah. Yeah. What I, what I liked along my journey is when I realized it's, it's eventually all about incentives, right? And cheap money just creates cheap uh, incentives. Like people don't really scrutinize the options that are in front of them, right? Like, Okay, if I go with option A, what happens, you know, over a certain amount of of time, or if I go with option B, etc. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, if I if I look back on that, like h- how I eventually connect that to more like the spiritual psychological part, eventually it does influence, you know, your current decision. And it sounds very logical, right? Like your current decision uh, influences the path of your life. But I think the problem here is that you are not able to make this decision freely. Well, you think you make it freely in your head, but because the money is corrupted, there's actually like a third party that also influences your decision making, mm-hmm. right? And that, you know, I, I think we can could go on a whole tangent with that, but eventually it, it kind of influences your free will in a sense. Like you think you are autonomous, but you know, there's still this third party that actually has more control over your life than most people realize. Yeah, absolutely. And again, those, those effects have secondary tertiary effects. There's all sorts of like third and fourth order effects that happen that, that, that come from cheap things. And so cheap food produces sick people. And then that produces a medical system that doesn't treat 
the underlying causes of diseases. They treat symptoms. And so, so one thing leads to another and cheap things beget other cheap things and quick solutions and, and, and that sort of thing. So we've become conditioned. Now, the beautiful thing is things have got, got so bad so fast that so many people have, have awakened to the problems in society and, and the things that are poisoning us slowly and, and, and not just, I'm not t- just talking about like a physical poisoning. I'm th- talking about like mental poisoning, the, the, the content that we consumed that was probably not the most edifying things. And so I believe that, that Bitcoiners are at the forefront of this, this turnaround. And I think that there was always, there were always the libertarians that were trying to get away from, you know, the, the, the two party systems. So there, there was these people, there was, there was health minded people that were trying to get away from the pharmaceutical establishment and the, the, you know, big agriculture establishment. There was always groups of people that were kind of fragmentedly fighting this fight before, but Bitcoin, because it is money, like you said earlier, it, it, it's the one thing that connects every element of society. And so Bitcoiners waking up and now having a currency. I mean, this is part of like the, the, the thesis of, of, of my new book, Parallel, is that's why we can finally have a true, robust parallel system, because before we had all sorts of people that wanted change, but we didn't have that technological advancement in, in the term in, in, in the form of money that we needed in, in order to have a true parallel economy. Um, and that's the, that's the three things you need. Anytime you see a paradigm shift in human history, there's always three things that are, that are there. There's a will for change. There's a social layer that connects those people. So like, if you have a million people that want change, but they don't know each other, then, th- then there's, there's, there's no synergy there, right? So there's a will for change. There's a social yeah. layer. And then there's a technological advancement. You can look at, the American Revolution, those three things were there. You can look at the Reformation, those three things were there. Like go back and study history. And any time human history pivoted away from centralization to decentralization, you will see that those three elements are there. The exciting thing is those three elements are present right now in the revolution that we're seeing. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, I love that. I think uh, also another big insight for me was, first I thought, okay, we should replace everything, right? Uh, Dollar backed by Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. But now I realized that parallel world right this other paradigm already exists and and Mm. people can just Mm. move to it right so we can just build the parallel thing advocate for the parallel thing educate on the parallel thing and people can eventually move to it right and then this this parallel paradigm will be a mirror for for the old paradigm you know and the people still in the old paradigm will look over and be like oh these these people over there are pretty happy, right? They're pretty optimistic. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should study that. And that yeah. thought, I absolutely love that because mm-hmm. that makes it way more optimistic to look towards the future instead mm-hmm. of, you know, looking at all the flaws and, 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 and yeah, bad, bad things that happen because of bad incentives in this, 
right. in this other system. Well, and what you're saying is like you're 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 living it by example. Like it, that's the best way to sell something is by living it, right? Fitness guy who <laughs> at my, I used to go to a gym back in the day, and there was this personal trainer, and I remember hearing him he always complain to to the girl at the front desk. He's like, "Ah, man, business is slow for me. Business is slow." Well, this guy was out of shape. He was big. And you could catch him like three or four times a day smoking a cigarette right out in front of the gym. And he was like, he clearly didn't take care of himself. He wasn't. And it's like, I wonder why nobody's coming to you for personal training because that it's the same thing. The guy that's big and jacked that knows the right answers, like the guy that wasn't taking care of himself could probably tell you the right answers. He could probably tell you how to get in shape. He knew all the, all the right answers, but he wasn't doing it himself. So you don't see the benefit. So when you, like you said, when you see this robust, thriving parallel system where people are healthy and they're living life and they're connected, they're not, they're not tuned into the matrix, like literally like we're, we're a half a generation away from, from people being in this metaverse all the time. And then there's going to be people that live in the real world, right? There's going to be people who literally get, go out and they, they do real things. They go to concerts and live events and they, they go to Bitcoin meetups. So I guess there won't be Bitcoin meetups ever, anymore because everybody's going to be a Bitcoiner, right? But, but that, that will seem so appealing. And one of the things I love, one of the quotes I love to quote, it's like my favorite quote, it's our Buckminster Fuller. And, and most Bitcoiners know this one, but he says, you never defeat the existing paradigm by, by trying to burn it down. I'm paraphrasing here. He goes, you, you win by building a better system. And then people, the market will just naturally go to that. And that's how, that's how meaningful change has always changed. You, you, you hear Marxists and, and, and people that, you know, they, they rail against the existing system. We need to burn it down. No. Nope. Like that's not how meaningful change is made. Meaningful change is made by just building something better and beautiful and people will want that. Yeah. That's also why it's so positive, right? I, I the, the Bucky Fuller quote, I think I also got from, from Jeff Booth. I think he was the person that opened my eyes to just the existence of this new paradigm that you can just move to basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's funny that you mentioned like, I don't know, like the anarchists or the, or, or, or the leftist people that are all angry or anyway, in general, the angry people, I would say, you know, like they, they are screaming at, at the wrong thing. They are looking at the wrong thing. And that's also why I sometimes feel like, like that is also part, part of the game or something, right? Like just mm -hmm. keeping people at a certain distraction, yelling at the wrong thing, you know, fine, they're yelling, they're not a threat, but you know, the actual threat is, uh, I love the quote, like you vote with your money, right? Like, mm -hmm. but, but literally you just choose another money and that's eventually so powerful because that will, you know, e eventually deconstruct this incentive structure that I think no one can really identify like what it looks like. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if people eventually just move to another system, as you said, like then, yeah, the grass might be greener on the other <laughs> side. So people yeah. will, will pay attention. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, it's funny you say that because the, the, the last chapter of parallel is called every day is election day. And it's not a political chapter. Mm -hmm. I, I think politics matter, but, like but that. I'm not one of those that says politics don't matter. But the point of the chapter is, you know, you might like, I asked a question, would you say society is screwed up? And everybody says, yes. And it doesn't matter what anybody's background is left, right, center, whatever. Oh, yes. Society, things are broken, right? We all agree. That's like the, the thing everybody agrees on. Well, guess what? Like, People say, oh, well, my, my vote doesn't matter because it's it's every four years or it's every November or it's whenever, right? And it's like, yeah, you're one of 100 million people that vote. I, I think it matters, but but like I get why you say it doesn't matter. Well, guess what? That the, the, the every day is election day is exactly what you said. Every decision you make, not just by like buying and holding Bitcoin, that's, that's, that's a big one. Like that's a really big one. But every decision you make in your life and, and even like audit your day now, every decision is an economic decision. And guess what? An economic vote has far greater power than a political vote. Political vote, say if there's 100 million votes in an election and somebody gets, candidate A gets 51 million votes, well, he gets 51% of the, the votes. Well, tomorrow he gets 100% of the power. It's a zero sum game. The guy that got 49% gets 0% of the power. His voters get 0% of the representation, right? Well, think about it. If there's a company who did $100 million in, in sales last year, and then they do something that people don't like. And this year, they only do $51 million in sales. Well, every one of those 49 million votes against them affects their bottom line. It affects their power. And so political votes, it's a zero-sum game. But with economic votes, 
every single vote counts every single time and go through your day. Like I was saying, audit your day. People say, oh, well, I just, I, I didn't do it. I didn't make any economic decisions today. I just, I just watched Netflix and I just hung out tonight. It's like, well, guess what? Netflix, watching Netflix is an economic decision. You say, well, the, I already paid for my monthly description, my, my monthly subscription. So it, why does it matter which show, show I, I watched? It's like whatever show you click on, is what is going to get dollars for season number two or season number three, mm -hmm. or th their company is going to put economic resources behind whatever we're paying attention to. So whether that's YouTube, you click on whatever link you click on, every single action you take is a vote because it's measured somewhere and there's economic value going to it. So yes, can I, can I put my economic value into Facebook and Instagram? Well, I do that to some degree, but is it more worthwhile to do things on Orange Bill app and Noster and, and perhaps Twitter and, and some things that advocate more for like where big Bitcoiners and, and, and freedom loving people exist. Maybe it's better to put some of my economic value into that because if that's the system I'm voting for, every time I click, it has the power of two. Every time I make an economic vote for the new system, it has the power of two because I'm taking one vote away from the existing system minus one on their category, and I'm adding a vote to the new system. So it has the power of two, minus one for the old old system, plus one for the new system. We do that 10 times a day. You make a, you make a thousand economic decisions a day. You don't need to change everything about your life. Just make 10 economic decisions per day for the new system. And guess what? After a year of Bitcoiners and, and freedom lovers doing that, we've made millions and millions and millions of economic decisions, votes for the new system without changing a whole lot. And it's painless and it's easy. And guess what? We all understand that the, the power of compounding effects after a year or two years of doing that, we're going to have built something very, very magical, very beautiful. And we'll be like, wow, we, we did a lot in a short period of time. Yeah, it's kind of like manifestation, right? Like where you point your attention is, is what what will grow eventually. I think, yeah, for me, it's one of the reasons that, you know, I, I started the podcast. I think we should create more touch points for people to be kind of like triggered, you know, on whatever subject we talk about on here to be like, hmm, okay, maybe this Bitcoin thing is something that I should look at, right? And that could be as broad, as you can imagine, right? But eventually it's about, okay, what do I want to spend my energy on? And yeah, what you spend your energy on is what eventually be, will be realized. And same as when you're watching Netflix, also if it's a crappy show, right? Like that will also eventually manifest in, in, in some way with your thinking or attitude or, or, or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, so how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with like your generational peers? I would assume you're also a millennial, yep. judging from the distance. But like, how, yeah, how do you experience that? Yeah, so the cool thing is I've been fairly effective in in orange pilling my friends and family, the people the people around me, because I've been I've been at it for for ten years now. I think it was twenty fourteen when was when I kind of started really getting. I started studying it twenty thirteen, really started diving into Bitcoin, like it's buying and trying to advocate for it in twenty fourteen, and so just a lot of trial and error. That's actually why I wrote my first book. But Bitcoin evangelism was it started out as a five page PDF for answering like common questions to my friends. Cause I, I, what I was noticing is in the bull runs, I'd get friends that I hadn't seen since high school <laughs> and they would text me and they'd say, Hey, Brian, can you explain Bitcoin to me? They just want me to explain it in a text message. I'm like, I can't explain it <laughs> in a text message. But so I started to write this like five page frequently asked question thing. And then that turned into 10 pages. Then I thought, you know what, to do this justice, I, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book on it. And I think the most effective thing that I found when, when talking to my peers, and this is, this, this could be for millennials or this could be for any age group is you have to ask questions first. You have to find what people care about because people will come to Bitcoin for, for different reasons, right? My, my freedom maximalist friends, you have to talk about censorship resistance. You have to talk about the Canadian truckers and how Bitcoin played an intricate role in sustaining free speech in, in, in Canada for my, for my gold bug father-in-law I needed to talk about Bitcoin's digital scarcity and how to, to try and explain to a boomer how something digital can't be changed. Like that's kind of what makes Bitcoin such a profound discovery is that we found a way to have something digital that can't be copied and pasted endlessly. Like that's, that's, it sounds like that's kind of complicated to explain to somebody, but that's part of why I wrote Bitcoin, Bitcoin evangelism is like, I wanted to be able to have these like axiomatic approaches. Like, how do you, how do you explain to, you know, a friend like, like my wife and her friends, 
their big, their big hold up on, on Bitcoin again with it being digital. They're like, I could never trust my money to an algorithm. And so for, for my wife and her friends, that was like the, the repetitive thing that kept coming up is I could never trust my, my, my money to an algorithm. I, and, and you just explain something as simple as you trust algorithms every single day with far more than your money. For example, when was the last time you drove through an intersection? Your kids in the back seat, you had your loved one there and you drove through an intersection at 50 miles an hour you know, with a green light and you didn't think twice about your life being in jeopardy. Well, that's, that's trustlessness because you, you trust in the algorithm of, of that intersection because you, you understand that the algorithm says that when north and southbound traffic have a green light, east and westbound traffic have a red light. That's, mm-hmm. just, that's all Bitcoin is. It's just if, if A sends to B, then we process this transaction. It, you trust it because it just works. So it's, it's essentially, it's trustlessness. It's like, I don't need to trust that the sky is blue. It just is. And so when you can break things down like that to people, but you never, you never know how to articulate your argument to a specific person. I wouldn't call it an argument. I guess you, would, you wouldn't know how to articulate your point to a person unless you ask them questions first. So it's so important to, so find out what people care about if you don't know already. Yeah. I love the concept of the traffic lights, right? Because with the traffic lights, it's, it, you, you don't have to think a lot about, okay, you know, it, it, is this algorithm or this decision making system, is, is it programmed correctly? Right. Because the entire point of the traffic lights is to keep, keep everyone safe and have this flow. Right. But when it comes to the topic of money, everything is so, abstracted, obscured, et cetera, right? Like, so it's way, way harder to understand. But if you keep with, with that concept of trustlessness, right? Like this is one of the dimensions that makes Bitcoin so special as a monetary system. And, and, and also why it's such a big paradigm shift compared to the fiat money system where you probably without knowing, most people don't realize, you know, money is not just money. Your money is influenced by, you know, a third party by other people that don't really care about your individual life and wants and needs, etc. right? Just because they don't know you, like not in a malicious way, they, they just don't know you. So the fact that something is introduced where it's like, okay, you don't have to trust anyone, just like with the traffic lights, you don't have to trust anyone like you. Once you understand that the idea is this is the perfect money for which you don't have to trust anyone and you verify that for yourself by of course, spending time and energy to study it like that. That's when you can get to the point of, okay, I can trust it like the, like the traffic light analogy. What, like, how do, how do you explain this trustlessness? Is this a good analogy or like, what's, what's the core value of this trustlessness part? Well, I think that the, the, the trustlessness thing you're saying, what, what, like, what is their concern in it or. No. So why is, you know, the introduction of trustlessness is something that is very foreign to people, right? Mm. Because they never consciously engage with something like that. And I think the traffic lights is a good example, yeah. right? But when it comes to money, plus the concept of trustlessness, you know, that's kind of when people get stuck in their thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I mean, and I think that that kind of branches out to people thinking that, well, even if you say the, say the traffic light algorithm just works right now, how do I trust that, that the code of it can't just be changed? Cause it's just computer code. Right. And so yeah. anytime there's computer code, how do I know that can be changed? And so then I think that that branches into like another good analogy. And then I, I stole this one directly from Knut van home. So he's a buddy of mine, co-author on a book. And, and so I, I have permission to constantly steal his, his analogy, but this is a good follow-up. If, if somebody inherently has this, th- this thought of, wow, you could just change the code. So can I, tr- I, I can't trust it. Right. He, he likens Bitcoin the consensus of Bitcoin to the rules of chess. What are the yeah, rules of chess? Like we all know the rules of chess. There's not like a, like a sheet somewhere that, that needs to be updated every time the rules of chess. There's just, there's a decentralized understanding of the rules of chess. Now you and I could create new game of chess. Like if you and I wanted to play where the pawn can move four, four, four moves or in any direction or diagonally or whatever, we could play a version of chess, you and I, where the rules are slightly different, but if you and I ever went to a chess tournament and we tried to start playing with those rules, the consensus of that tournament would, would just laugh us out. We would be disregarded. Our, our, our fake version of chess would be disregarded by the true <laughs> network of chess players. And so mm-hmm. that's how decentralized consensus works. No central entity owns the rules of chess. 
It's just that there's a decentralized understanding of what chess is, chess is. And so can you change the rules of chess? Well, I can't, you can't, uh, the government literally like the government, like, like president Biden or president Trump or whoever could issue an edict that says, no, we're changing the rules of chess. And guess what? The rules of chess would not change unless the all players of the of chess wanted to change those rules. And so I think those types of like axiomatic examples really help to illuminate Bitcoin of like, wow, this this isn't a foreign entity, right? Like like chess is something that whether you play it or not, you have a certain level of comfort. You're like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Like I just can't I can't change something because it's out there. It, when something's decentralized, it, it makes it very difficult to change the way it is done. And so that's what Bitcoin is. And Bit Bitcoin there's there's greater vested interests in Bitcoin and not changing the rules of Bitcoin than not changing the rules of chess. So you and I can't change the rules of chess. It would be even harder for us to change the rules of Bitcoin. Yeah, this is the last week I had a call with a guy who said he was already pretty deep into Bitcoin, but he had some questions. And one of the questions was, yeah, what if you now just copy the code Literally, this he said this exactly. He said like copy the code and you make you know Bram's Bitcoin. And then I really struggled with answering that because my the only thing I could say was like yeah, but why would you do that? Like anyone can do that, but there's no there's nothing to achieve if you do that, right? So it's kind of like back to this incentive part. Like the incentive to comply and adopt is bigger than to corrupt and and ignore it, basically, mm-hmm. right? And there could be an electrician or a mechanic, right, that fumbles with the with the traffic light situation, but that would be like a one time thing, you know. Maybe some car crashes or someone gets hurt or whatever, just because this guy or person wanted to do that, right? But that would not corrupt the concept of traffic lights and the the algorithm or the rules of the traffic lights at, at an intersection, mm-hmm. basically. And yeah, right. I love the chess example because we could make, you know, the Bram and Brian chess yeah. game. But then we would be the only ones playing it, which could be fun, <laughs> yeah. right? But th- that it's is a not... novelty, right? And that's and that's exactly yeah. And yeah. and if maybe you and I want to experiment with, you know, what if chess did this, and and if we made a decent enough version of it, then then maybe all of chess would accept that, right? But chances are, <laughs> we're not going to create something that that we could win people over to. And going back to your to your friend's question, I think that's where. You then pick up this conversation of network effects. If somebody's asking those questions, it's great. They're basically guaranteed to be a Bitcoiner because because they're asking, pretty far. But this is yeah, yeah right. Like they're this asking is like the right the questions. That's there, right? Yeah, it's threats. He thinks. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and 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 what I tell them is like that's the importance of network effect. So in that case, I would liken it to you know, could I create my own my own version? Well, like let's look at let's look at language. I could create my own language and there's like siblings who do that, right? You have two sisters who create their own babbling language and they can kind of understand it with one another. And it has some value between them in a very small network. Maybe perhaps five or six of their friends know this little language and it has a little bit of value. But what has tremendously more value is if they just speak English, right? It's this network that already exists. So is it more valuable for you to create your own language or is it more valuable to just tap into English, this protocol, this language that already exists? Because guess what? If you want to do business, English is a good tool to use. If you want to make friends, English is a good tool or a good protocol to use. If you want to be able to order food, English is a good protocol to use. Same thing with Bitcoin. If, if you want business connections, then there's Bitcoiners out there except Bitcoin. There's, there's food delivery that accepts Bitcoin. There, there are, there, there's, you know, economic connections, social connections, all sorts of things. So you could create, yeah, Brian, Brian's Bitcoin 5.0, but what kind of connections are out there? There's, there, there's, there's little to no value in that. So we could do it as a novelty, but there's, it brings back, it, it helps the, the, the listener of your point come back to the understanding of like, yes, there's value in tapping into this network, which is the Bitcoin payment protocol. Yeah. It would also probably cost you less energy to participate and comply than to try to, yeah. you know, to change it. Yeah. Yeah. Networks at so, scale are yeah. vastly more efficient than, and like you said, cost efficient than networks that are not at scale. Yeah. It's funny because if you then look back at like, because then, okay, someone could say, well, but chess is, I'm not, I don't know, I'm going to butcher this, you know, a thousand years old. I don't even know how old probably, chess is, no. probably older. I don't know. Don't hate me. But 
you know, people are going to be like, yeah, but this is already, it, it exists for such a long time. And, and, you know, everyone in, around the world knows about it and people teach each other and there's books, et cetera. Like, how would you counter that? Like, I'm, I'm trying to just peel away, you know, like all the objections, but someone would, could say something like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, that the, the length of it is, I guess it has some validity because in Bitcoin, we, 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 Base the chain that has the longest block, <laughs> the longest blockchain is, is kind of like the valid, the valid, the valid chain. So we would say some, I mean, that is correct to some degree. Um, but really the decentralization, the, the number of, the number of nodes on that network are probably more valuable. So yeah, I would agree. I would, I would tell them, I would say great point. I said uh, chess, chess has the, the long game <laughs> as opposed to Bitcoin, but Bitcoin in terms of Dig native digital money has the longest chain. So it's the most robust history of any coin that's out there. So if you, if your friend's trying to show you XRP or Ethereum or Solana or any one of these coins, you just say, well, it, it, the same way that you made a valid point about chess having a, a longer history than Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin has a longer history than any of the other digital assets. Um, and so yes, tomorrow Bitcoin will be more valuable in consensus than it is today and the day after it'll be more into do i see it going anywhere between now and 10 years from now i don't i don't think it dies between now and 10 years from now so i i think that there's there's mm -hmm. only going to be strength to that argument as time goes on but i think it's a valid point and i think it's it's actually good to concede some of those things sometimes because i mean just even in, in the ebbs and flows of discussion give credit where credit is due because i think that's actually a, a really interesting point i mean unless you have kind of a, a counterpoint to that well, now, now that we're talking, I'm thinking, and, and I do this a lot, actually. I think once you step into this frame of argumentation without someone consciously knowing why they ask it, that's hard, right? Because you could like step into this frame and then you start comparing Bitcoin to Ethereum as you just did, you know, which could be a flawed argument because they are two totally different things, right? So you kind of step into this length of existence. But I, I was thinking, well, it's actually also quite amazing that Bitcoin in the short time span that it has lived has established such strong incentives, just like chess. I'm going to Google while I talk because now I want to know, you know, sixth century AD. Okay. Well, so because, you know, in 15 years, Bitcoin has established the same incentives to participate, you know, and just follow the rules of this protocol as chess has done in over a thousand years, right? And that is actually a very high signal thing. And if you don't believe that, well, you can try to just copy the code that you can you know, find on the internet and then, you know, just create your own Bitcoin version and see how that goes, right? And I think with Bitcoin, there's a lot of these things. Like people say like, oh, it's existing for 15 years. Like why, why isn't it at a million, you know, but yeah, that, that, I don't know. I, I don't like these counter arguments. Like that's a short time frame. But if you turn it around, like I say, you know what's crazy? That 15 years ago, a random idea on a random internet forum is now adopted by the biggest Wall Street degenerates. <laughs> you know, like that should be your signal, yeah. right? After 15 years, like, do you know how many ideas are let loose on the internet every day, mm -hmm. let alone for the past 15 years? Right. And look at this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like your answer better than mine. We're going to go with your answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's funny. I think you said discussion. I think it's more, yeah, it's a discussion or it's like this explorative conversation. Right. But I sometimes feel like, well, yeah, I've also been in Bitcoin for 10 years, of course, up and down with understanding and studying and stuff. But yeah, I feel like I understand this thing, you know, not fully because no one, no one knows it fully, but I look at it from a certain way where I think like, it would help people if they think in a different way. Sometimes mm -hmm. people don't know why they think a certain thing, right? Yeah. And then you're kind of drawn into following their argumentation where I think sometimes it's perhaps more beneficial that you kind of, yeah, just flip this entire, the entire narrative or the questioning around, or maybe answer the question, oh, sorry, answer the question with a question. Right? Yeah. Like, okay, but why do you think it works like this? Or why do you ask this question, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, some people find that very annoying, but I think it's a nice way to just get a little bit deeper with regards to, you know, what, what do they believe in or mm. do they even believe in something? That's great. Yeah. No, that's a great point. So what do you think is the main thing people should unlearn? 
before they can understand Bitcoin? I've literally never been asked that question. That's a, that's a great question. I, I, I do think about those things in general a lot, but what's the, what's the first thing that they should unlearn? Well, let me kind of parlay into that. I, I think that it, it's incredibly value for, valuable for people to ask the question, what is money? And so I think that perhaps, I think most people don't have to unlearn what they think money is because most people just don't have a concept of, of money. I think that, that that maybe that's what it comes down to is, is what is money and who has the right to it? We're just kind of, we, we have a presupposition. So I guess, yes, the, I guess you would have to unlearn the presupposition that money is supposed to be given to you by government. And I think that as soon as we start to realize that it's not a permission that's given to us by government, then I think that it, it, it kind of illuminates what the, the, the function of money is in society. It's almost like we expect, well, yeah, you know what? The economy really needs to pick up. So, so the government needs to print some more money to stimulate the economy, or we really need to stimulate the economy because we need to lower interest rates, or we, we, that we need to stimulate the economy because the Fed needs to say X, Y, or Z. That's, that's such a broken misconception of the way economics is supposed to work. It's crazy to me how many people think that here in the United States, we have a free market system and yet we cannot wait until the Fed chairman makes his next announcement until companies can make their economic decisions. Like that is central planning to the max. And so when central banks have that role, I think that's, a, that's the biggest thing that we need to unlearn. Even my financially prudent friends, my friends that understand how to invest in stocks and, 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 and they're, they're wise with the way they use their money right now. They're broken form of money. They're good with the way they use it right now. They save more of it than they spend and those types of things. They have this preconceived notion that money is given to us from on high and that on high is government. And I believe that it's actually, yeah, I believe money is given to us from on high, but I believe it's, 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 it's from, it's, it's from the creator. I think that we're given something as free men. It's, it, it's money that we can voluntarily participate with. Money's whatever we choose. And I think that naturally the market will always go. If, if, if uninhibited by large central entities, the market will always go to the best form of money. Yeah. I think we, we touch upon what we talked about in the beginning, right? It's, I've been starting to say like the money you're using, you're being forced to use that money, right? Some people don't like these words like theft and force. I don't mm -hmm. like the word theft either, but I use force, right? Like you're forced to use this money. Like, there was never a point in your life where you're like, oh yeah, okay, uh, I agree to use this this money. And then some people will say, well, because you use it, you agree, right? Like as a child, when you go to a store, et cetera. But like you are forced to use this money that another party, the government creates. And I think that's already where you have like a decision, you know, could be a red blue pill moment where you be like, okay, but the government has, you know, my best interests at heart or not, or they have good intentions or not, right? Like you have to already make a decision if you agree with the fact that there's a central authority that gives you the money well, that you're eventually forced to use. Whereas if you just believe, okay, well, anything could be money and together, everyone together decides on what the best money is, that would create a, a totally different environment, I think, mm -hmm. of people creating stuff, building stuff, trying to figure out together what what the money could be. And I, I like the cigarette in jail example, right? Like that, like you can have a lot of cigarettes and don't smoke. I love that. I love that idea that, you know, you don't even have to use your money for the utility mm -hmm. value of the, mm -hmm. of the thing. But it, there, there's a lot of other places outside of a fiat money system where people are naturally drawn towards a certain thing that, you know, enough people have consensus about. And that then becomes the money that, that, just sounds way nicer in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I find the, the cigarettes in prison a great, great analogy. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's useful to think through those dynamics and you think about it to the individual who does not smoke and lives in, and lives in prison and he, he has hoarded a bunch of cigarettes. He benefits from the fact that he doesn't smoke, right? Because if he had a habit of exactly. smoking, yes. yeah, he, so, <laughs> yes. he, so he's incentivized. Yes. Like if we had money, like if, if steaks, <laughs> if steaks were, were money, then vegetarians would be the richest people on earth because they'd be able to hoard the steaks and then <laughs> use them for other things. Or, or if, you know, that's why I would even say it's kind of one of my arguments for, for why Bitcoin is better than gold. I think there's a lot of probably better arguments for why Bitcoin is better than gold, but it is, it is, I, I will bring it up when we talk about the, 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 prisoner cigarettes analogy because of the fact that 
you know, gold, gold bugs always say, well, I can use gold for other things. Well, if you're consuming gold for other things, like if you're putting it in your electronics and you're, you're, you're turning it into jewelry and things like that, then you're actually, you're like the guy who's smoking the cigarettes, right? You're not the guy who's, who's reserving it for the use to spend it as money. Because if I turn it into a watch, yes, it might, it might retain some value, but then in order, I can't, I could never take that watch and then go buy something with that watch or it'd be very difficult to do that. I'd have to then turn it into something that's more useful as money and then go spend it. And so, yeah, it's like the guy who Bitcoin is like, everybody is the guy who doesn't smoke in prison. <laughs> and so he gets to, <laughs> he gets to hoard the cigarettes. That's a good quote. That's a good quote. I, I want to be mindful of your time. If you have time for two more, Let's two more it. questions. Let's do it. So you, you are pretty proficient at getting people to research Bitcoin, right? But do you see, do you see like a lot of nihilism around you? Like, do you think that people that are still in the, this like current paradigm, do you think they're more nihilistic? And then also, are you optimistic? Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people that are nihilistic and you see this on, on both ends of the spectrum, right? There's, there's people that have kind of a, a secular worldview that like, yeah, the world's going to, to hell in a handbasket. And there's like, there's religious people that are like, oh, revelations coming true. And, you know, they were in the last days and all that kind of stuff. I, 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 I don't know the answers to any of these things, but I do. I have a generally optimistic outlook. I think things are, are on a path to getting better. But like the old saying goes, the, the dawn is, or the night is darkest before the dawn, right? Like it all, things always physically, like, like logically, the darkest moment will always be before it starts to get lighter. And I just think that that's what we've experienced. I mean, there's a lot of terrible, terrible things going on in the world, but I, I see all around me that there's people like you, there's people that I meet every single day that are pushing for a better world, for things to function better, for, for people to have a better understanding. And I think people think that the, the trend of humanity is towards a better future right now. There's a lot of forces that are trying to to suppress that, but I really do. I see the best in humanity. I think I think mankind is is fallen and we're broken and we're, we're we 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 have problems. But I also think that there's 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 a there's a movement of people pushing for a better world. And like I said, I believe that we have those three elements that make for change, which is a will for change, a social layer of people that connect those those who want the change, and and technological advancements that make that possible. And so I, I would let history be the, the, the determinant of why I'm so optimistic. I believe history, the, the lessons of history are on our side. Awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic as well. I think that is also what Bitcoin brings you, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that you know that there's a tool that can help us get out of this manipulation, basically, that, that we live in. And I think, well, you can get stuck with the manipulation and be like, no, I don't have free will and <laughs> everything sucks, but I don't know, man. It's just, uh, it's also more fun to be optimistic and mm -hmm. just be like, okay, I don't know where this is going to end, but I think we'll figure it out. You know, like that. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know. Like uh, may maybe we are luckily lucky in the sense how we're wired or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think it's like you said, we said, we both said earlier is we have done our homework though. I think that one of the biggest things is people that are nihilistic, I think that they have not broken the cycle or the the hypnosis of propaganda in their lives. And so if you're caught in the hypnosis of propaganda, then it, yeah, things probably feel doom and gloom because why do forces out there want you to feel nihilistic? Because people who are weak or people who feel broken or people who feel threatened, those people will always turn to an authority figure to fix their problems. And so there's a lot of money focused on propaganda and, and social programming to make people feel that way so that they will want some politician to come in or some some entity or some person to come along and fix their problems for them. And so you and I, I believe that 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 perhaps we've we, we've studied, we've started we, we have we have templates for how to break that cycle of propaganda in our lives that we're completely immune to propaganda because I see a commercial for, you know, a cheeseburger and I'm like, man, I want to go get a cheeseburger, right? Like, like we're not completely immune to those things, but at the same time, they don't rule our lives. And so, yes, we have a bit of optimism because we see that, that some of the solutions are solutions that are within grasp. They're things that I can materially make an impact in my life and the lives of other people around me by, by actions that I do. I think the nihilistic people think that the actions can only happen if this this political savior comes along and makes it happen. 
And of course, that's, that's what the politicians want us to think. I, I'm actually doing a video on this this week where the, the approval rating here in the United States of, of Congress, it's at an all time low. It's below 20%. Congress has is a below 20% approval rating. But do you know what the reelection rate of Congress members are? It's over 90%. And so, so wow. there's a disconnection between, cause the approval rating is, is really a, a metric of how good is Congress doing? Mm-hmm. The re-election rate is is a metric of how well is the propaganda working, right? So, so if if the approval rating is below twenty percent, the re-election rate should be a, a below twenty percent. But it's because those politicians have done a very very good job of telling us that they will fix the problem, even though we don't like the current situation. And so, we as Bitcoiners, we see beyond that. We still. Perhaps we vote, maybe we don't vote, whatever it happens to be, but we do see that the solutions are things that we can we can have a, an impact on right now today. And certainly buying and holding Bitcoin does that, going out and spending Bitcoin perhaps does that. There's all sorts of things we can do in addition to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it comes from the fact that if if you really dive into Bitcoin, and of course we are advocating for Bitcoin, for people to study Bitcoin, I have to emphasize, but like you can verify everything and anything about Bitcoin, mm-hmm. right? So the conviction you build comes from the study that you do and everything is out there for you to judge for yourself. And I think if you understand Bitcoin, you basically also understand that you can trust yourself. And that's what kind of gives you this shield against the propaganda, right? Mm-hmm. Because if someone something is proposed to you, then yeah, you will not swallow it or adopt it <laughs> immediately, right? You will be like, Hmm, okay, that's strange. Let me do my research or let me just put my thinking cap on. And then, you know, you can quickly dissect that and just also judge that, you know, it's not beneficial for me to adopt this or listen to this or, or whatever. And I, 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 at least in my experience, that comes from studying Bitcoin and mm-hmm. having like a few beliefs and understandings shattered to see that, you know, that is like a healthy thing to do. And also, in my personal case, I think it's a fun thing to do. Like, why would you not think? But th- apparently that's not uh, something a lot of people do, but that's funny. All right. I want to be mindful of the time. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question. What is a core belief you will never let go? To, to me, like I told you at the beginning of the show, it's a religious conviction. I, I, I used to be an atheist. I was a pretty ardent atheist, tried to disprove a few family members, took a, took a deep dive. And, and now I'm, 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 pretty deeply convicted of of the Christian belief that Jesus died, rose again, as crazy as I always thought that sounded. I I believe that that's a historical thing that happened. And I think it has a, a material impact on our on our on our eternal soul. So I am somebody that is always willing to hear critiques and criticisms. I read a lot of atheists still today. I'm always trying to overturn my beliefs because I I, I it's like it's like good soil. I think that good soil is only good when it's churned up. So like, yeah, I, I think that's a belief that I will, I will probably never change, but I am constantly trying to challenge it because I actually don't want to believe something that's not true. So if anybody has any uh, good refutations of that, I would love to hear it. Um, but that is something that I, as, as, as a 38 year old man, having been studying this for the last 20 years, this is, this is kind of where I'm at right now. And, and I, I think that that's probably, I'm rigidly there for the rest of my life, but happy to be proven wrong, just like, just like I am with Bitcoin, but, but feel pretty, it's a hill I would die on for lack of a better term. All right, man. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks so much for your time. And thanks for this conversation. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did also make sure to check out this video right here, or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.